Welcome to our podcast, We Have Issues. I'm Joe Pizzo, and my co-host is Dr. Frank Rudneski. Frank, are you all set to go? We are fired up. I am fired up, and let's get moving, Joe. All right. Now, you and I, before we went on, we're talking about some different things, and we mentioned that we'd like to talk about standardized testing and maybe the culture and climate that that exists around that that whole process. Now, I'm going to start out with a quote from Diane Ravitch. Diane Ravitch says that sometimes the most brilliant and intellectual minds, intelligent minds, sorry, do not fare well in a standardized test because they do not have standardized minds. What do you think about that? You know what? That brings me to another quote, and I can't tell you who uh, whose quote it is. So I, I'll take credit for it. Standardized tests create standardized students. So is that the end game? I think not for educators like us and for, well, the people that we work with every day, the people we, we come in contact with. But it, it's almost like uh, like a disease. I mean, second only to the pandemic. When you talk about standardized testing, it just creates a lot of distress in not only the students, but the teachers. And when that happens, they're not, they're not really reaching their potential in any clear cut way, cut way. Now, what can we do about the stress level around standardized tests? Not only for the students, but for the faculty, for the parents, for the community, and, and basically the whole educational system, it seems. You know, there's a there's a Peter Drucker quote, and I, he's attributed to him. I don't know if, again, if it's his or not, but culture eats strategy for breakfast. So if you digest that, you know, think about it. If people are in an environment, in a place where they want to be, amazing things happen. So if students feel welcome, if educators feel welcome, and I'm not just talking about certified staff, but anybody that works in a school it contributes to the climate and the culture and uh, you know I, I found out that uh if you're in a place where you want to be then other people are also in that same place and if you bring down the level of stress for uh, accomplishment and amp it up for let's do this whole child thing which you and i are both proponents of then that's where you hit that amazing point of achievement that that's my opinion. I think the opinions of everyone that has seen it happen. See, I, I like the fact that, that you're talking about the whole child because I'm remembering a quote that Ken Robinson, Sir Ken Robinson uh, had made a few years ago. And it, to me, it, it's so simple yet it really captures the essence of that whole idea he said that a three-year-old is not one half a six-year-old. And when you think about it, we go through all these different stages and there's a readiness factor. And that I think is, is as important as anything. With standardized testing, we tend to shun the readiness factor. We're trying to get a measure. And by doing so, we're measuring things that are almost absurd being able to do well on a standardized test is a skill and it also might be the product of how are you feeling that day mm -hmm. what was going on as you were coming to school that day and maybe somebody said something on the bus that just devastated your your whole day what's going on at home is there a weather factor involved that maybe during this time of year or climate factor during this time of year, you, you're just not as productive as you are at other times. And there, there's so many variables that I don't mind standardized tests if they're used for diagnostic purposes. What bothers me is when a standardized test is used and it puts a label, you are able to, you are unable to, and the, the test questions, I've written some test preparation books, and I know that there's a certain way to write those questions purposely to see just how careful 
a student will be, will there be a double negative? Is there a phrase that misleads? And in life, yes, that's important, but we usually have people around us who are helping to edit, who are helping to advise, who are helping to steer us in certain directions. And I think that's something that, that standardized testing doesn't do. It gives a snapshot on a particular day of a set of skills that maybe during the year, if it's given at the beginning of the year, we can work on. But I've always said, give me a piece of writing and a day or two with that student. And I can tell you what the needs are just because of actions and reactions and product. What do you think? You know what, you you, met, you mentioned a couple of things and I, I say this all the time, whether, first of all, the favorite, one of the favorite uh, parts of my educational journey has been as a middle school principal where I spent 17 years of my career. And uh, now uh, at, at when I'm teaching at the university level, a lot of things are the same. You never know what that person sitting in front of you had to go through to get there. Hey, I know what I had to do do to, to get there. And sometimes as a principal, I had dogs barking. I had kids screaming. I had wives yelling in a positive way, of course, but to just get out the door. So what does a 10 year old have to do? What does an 11 year, 12, 13 year old have to do to, to be in that environment? And when they feel like they are being judged by a test score rather than their whole being their whole person, their whole persona, then, well, I think we are selling them short. The biggest form of identity theft is telling somebody they can't accomplish something. So in that one remote day, somebody doesn't do well and they equate that as we have to equate that, as the state has to equate that with, with that standardized testing, then uh, we're selling everybody short, including ourselves, including our colleagues across the hallway. We don't know what they had to do to get here. The business world a few years back was crying for better standards, more accountability, and we need to send them students who are able to do the things that now we've changed our whole perspective from both points of view. Business is now saying we need students who have power skills. We can teach them the skills. There, there are businesses who say, look, you don't need the MBA. We can teach you that. What we need is to make sure that you show up on time, that you represent this shield, this brand in the best way possible, that you have a background in the arts. So when we send you out and you're representing our company, that we're sending out someone who's erudite, someone who's well-rounded, someone who is going to put our company in the best light possible. And we need somebody who's actually going to stay with the task until it's finished. And standardized testing does none of that. That's a shame. How about, I mean, you're right. How about problem solvers? How about inventors? How about no box thinkers? And I mean, our students weren't born that way. They, were, they weren't born inside of a box until we stuck them in there. We equated them to a test score. And now let's move uh, accordingly. No, they are born great thinkers. So why, why stifle them? It, it, it's ridiculous. I remember one time uh, as a principal, we, uh, a student vomited on the test sheet. And we had to go in with gloves, put it in a plastic bag, identify the bag, call the Department of Education and make sure that it was done correctly. And I, are, are you kidding me? <laughs> it, it seems like uh, we somebody lost sight of what we're trying to accomplish or what we should be accomplishing. It's, it's sad when you think that the instructions given, at least in New Jersey, during the um, uh, first couple of years of this, this new iteration of testing, we, we have gone from uh, the 
absurd to the ridiculous, it seems. And I remember sitting in a meeting and being told that when I was going to distribute the test, that I was not to sit down. The testing period is about two hours long. And I thought, okay, so how do we make an accommodation maybe for the person who pulled a muscle while carrying all those books and whatever to give to certain students to read because that was the high interest. And now they can't sit down, they have to stand. And you can't look at the student's screen because you're liable to see what's on the test. And it almost felt like we were going on a, on a special undercover operation to overtake the world. And here we were giving a simple standardized test. And you couldn't answer a student's question other than do the best you can Although throughout the year, if a student asked a question, you said, thank you for asking the question. I'm glad that you reached out when you didn't understand. Yet in a, a standardized test, that's not a possibility. So it's, it's kind of running counter, not only to logic and reason, but to the process and procedure. It's almost as if you have engineers who are creating a plan for an automobile, but they don't drive. And they may have the greatest plan on paper ever seen, but unless you can get behind that wheel and you know what's going to happen in, under different climate conditions, and you know what comfort is, and you know what's necessary and unnecessary, it's absurd. Learning is not done by a checklist. It's, it's dynamic and it's tiered, and it's spiral. And that's a tough thing to have to teach, but it's even a tougher thing to think you can test it. Yeah, it is. I mean, and how about this? The, how about the people administering the test? And you, you alluded to that in, at, at the beginning of this section of your conversation. How about if we create an environment where people want to go to? And if we change that, if we shift that paradigm to a positive climate and culture where everyone feels valued, where those kids coming in, those crossing guards, those uh, instructional aides, the teachers, the cafeteria workers all feel valued, it creates a different type of environment. So when it comes time to testing, they know that this isn't the most valuable thing you're going to do, not only in your life, but this week this day etc and let's plan accordingly you've done i've seen some phenomenal things that you've done i've never physically been in your classroom but how about what you and your colleague do with the uh, inspiration cafe i mean wow that's a very low stress level isn't that creating inventing uh experience uh, a, a quality of belonging through a culture of dignity so for for me that's what affects the test score so much and we could prep 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 and there's certain obviously uh lesson plans teaching and learning activities that we do for that but if we're doing the curriculum like we're supposed to and have a high level of positive climate and culture i just think it shifts and it's just for those students rather than the stress level we could diminish that in a very very positive way by having a climate and culture i mean hey look culture eats strategy for breakfast <laughs> having students getting the opportunity to reach out to uh find what they maybe didn't even realize is exciting to them is the whole idea behind what we do at inspiration cafe and it's it's a program where we bring in people from various backgrounds and we've had kids say Wow, I never realized that. Oh my gosh, we've had uh, slam poets. We've had uh, a former Rockefeller Center rocket. We've had 
accountants. We, we've had people from all different backgrounds. And the idea behind that is what you're saying with culture, it's to redefine who we are. It's to redefine where we're going. And it's to redefine the possibilities that lie ahead for us. That's the thing that I think we miss in a lot of our education, not only in standardized tests, but maybe in some of the so-called drill work. We look at certain skills that are low and we think, hmm, we've got to, to drill more. We have to get skills, 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 and we're going to stay with these skills until we get them. All you're doing is you're, you're making them more difficult because you've so turned off students to that whole idea of drills. I remember in high school coming home at night with an algebra problem, but it wasn't just one problem on a page. It was 45. <laughs> and we were assigned 45 because that's how many were on the page. And it was two skills. One skill had 22 problems. The other had 23 problems. And after doing about six or seven of those and understanding the concept, you'd find that you'd start to make mistakes because your mind was drifting. It, it was almost like doing piecework, like being on an assembly line. And there are many, many studies that try to figure out how to keep people engaged on an assembly line. And the conclusions are never give them more work and make sure that they stay focused on that task only. We know from all the brain theory that, that we need variety and, and we need stimulus and we need excitement. And we also need that, that heart factor, that caring factor. Uh, I'm glad you have Yoda looking over your shoulder because so far everything I've said seems to be approved and that's a good thing. Well, I mean, Yoda is one of my mentors and uh, I actually, <laughs> you know, you think about uh, no, no box thinking. I had a, an advisory when I was a principal and uh, one year my advisory was uh, Jedi night training. And they were actually students who thought they were going to become Jedi Knights at the end of the uh, of the year. We, we weren't. But if you train one person to be a Jedi Knight, you can become a Jedi Master. So it was kind of selfish for me, uh, but they we never were able to perfect the lightsaber like Yoda has. But isn't it isn't it fun just to allow those students to choose and pick and you talk about differentiating according to interests or what i call passion and if you could do that then that will make all the difference in the world if you have an assignment where a student can hand in an interest part let's say you're creating a civil war unit and one student is very passionate about baseball and then he or she comes up with an activity that includes baseball during the Civil War period. Boom. You have that student forever. They look at the world differently. That creates a tipping point for them where they look at themselves differently. And that's, uh, that's who we're trying to become. And yeah, the accountability is important. Data is important. But it's going to be there. So... Uh, you know, the, and the better school districts already have it. And maybe some of the lower performing districts don't. But hell, it, we still we still owe it to those students to allow them to grow, to create that whole person. That, that there's a Jesuit um, the Latin phrase called cura personalis, which means creating the whole person and that's that's always how i proceeded even before i knew the concepts and, and and the research behind it but but the same with you brother joe is that you've always proceeded to create rather than stifle and that's that's where we get in new jersey hey we're great we're great at at, at a compliance <laughs> but let, let's expand that a little bit to include some growth for everyone we're doing right now in my class of 60s project and we do it as as the foundation for reading the outsiders because the outsiders took place during that time period mm -hmm. and the kids research all the different areas and the neat thing is that they learn so much more and they're so excited and they love the outsiders anyway 
So it's like building one level on top of the other. And I was able to do comparison contrast this week. I would play two songs from the 60s and I would say, okay, how does this one singer or group deal with this issue differently than this other? Hmm. Do you notice the sound on this piece is very similar to the sound on this other piece? And, and I would say to the students just casually, I'd say, we just did comparison contrast. Hmm. And we didn't do it with worksheets. And you weren't there. Read this piece. Now answer these questions. Now read this second piece. What is similar? No, oh, we, we did it and they didn't even realize they were doing comparison contrast. But we covered it and we covered it for about three days. And it, it just made it fun. I have to know what were the two songs? Well, I, I had I had a whole bunch of different songs. I had some bubblegum music. I had I had two Beach Boys songs. One was a Beach Boy song, one was a Jane and Dean. And I said to them, listen to this Beach Boy song. And it was like Surf City or, or, or I'm sorry. Um um, Barbara Ann, one of those. And I said, now listen to the Jan and Dean song. And do you hear in the background the people singing on the Jan and Dean song? Yeah? Well, that's the Beach Boys. Because they played on each other's songs and they sang on each other's songs. So when you're hearing them, you can make a comparison that, yeah, the sound is very similar. And they all agreed that they would take anything but the bubblegum music. They didn't like the bubblegum <laughs> music at all. <laughs> I played Chewy Chewy and uh, I, I played an Archie song. And uh, they said, yeah, well, you know, that's that's cool. But I said, OK, so now you've con contrasted the two. You see that the beach music and the car music was a little bit more exciting. And then we played some of the music that was protest music. And I said, do you hear the sound in this? How it's not happy bouncy. It's not very lighthearted. It's people telling you, Barry McGuire, we're on the eve of destruction. Things are falling apart. But they were protesting the conditions. And the conditions to some people were falling apart. So there are so many different ways to do things, to bring it in. And I know as, as someone who goes out and works with schools, you do the same thing because I was fortunate enough to see you work uh, when Barry Sade invited you in, invited Ken Pasek and I in, and we kind of went back to back with our presentations. And I saw a kindred spirit right then and there because we look at a task, but then we look at the way to deliver that task, not only efficiently, but I, I think the key, and I always tell this to my students, you need to have the fundamentals, but don't forget the first syllable, fun. If you can put fun in the fundamentals, you're going to learn them a whole lot better. If you leave fun out of the fundamentals, well, anybody can do that. There's nothing creative about that. There's nothing exciting. There's nothing engaging. So let's see how we can engage each other. You know what else it allows them to do? Take those calculated creative risks. Yes. yes. Move to the end of their comfort zone where they can see their full potential. And, you know, some of the times, like you just said, I, re I remember when you did that same unit before and I, I saw you dressed up like, uh, you know, with your tie dye and your headband. And for those students who never saw you like that before, they were probably blown away in a positive way, allowing themselves now to take those creative risks, to step out of their comfort zones, which you're not allowed to do uh, during the uh, standardized testing period, by the way. And Correct. now it creates a whole new them. <laughs> and, you know, they, they, they're they allowed to be who they are. And that's, that's where we should see their value. When we did our unit where we took the poetry and then we had the kids after they wrote their original poetry, 
write original music for it electronically. And I worked closely with uh, Dr. Ken Pasek on that. Uh, and as you know, he's our amazing in, instructional um, coach and, and a, a terrific music teacher. Mm -hmm. And the kids who were the most successful, the most engaged, the most excited were the ones who would easily be written off in a testing situation. Those were the kids who had the IEPs and had the 504s or were having issues and heaven forbid, uh, they're not fitting into that standard mold. But I have kids who weren't really talking much now almost becoming chatterboxes and kids who wouldn't raise their hands now putting their hands up and saying, yeah, I, I, I've got something to offer. And you see that transformation and you know, it feels so good because there's a difference. You made a difference. I, I know you do that in your, in your college classes as well. Hey, look, you know what the great thing about that is some of the activities that I use when I go out and facilitate leadership training for uh, the middle schoolers are the same exact ones that are used for the university students. Sure. And the parallels are uh, amazing. And what I found is like, sometimes the middle schoolers are are better at it because they have more of a free spirit. And then the university students, I see them. Ah, uh, Yes, we can have this opportunity to move to move beyond our comfort zone, but it was our comfort zone when we were middle school students. The one thing I think that, that we have forgotten sometimes in education, and part of it is that we listen so much to outside influences and we're not necessarily a profession that sets our parameters, but that's another issue for another show. What we forget is the human factor. There's a heart in every student. There's a heart in every teacher. There's a heart in every administrator. And that everybody in a building is a teacher at one time or another. Even the students are teachers. I learn from my students every single day and I'm never going to stop. And I love the fact that if I make a mistake, I don't love making mistakes, but if I make a mistake, a student can say, excuse me, I, I think that might be wrong. Okay, let's talk about it. And they're right many of the times. And I'll say, you're absolutely correct. Thank you. It's okay to be wrong. And, and I let them know that you were polite. You handled yourself in the correct way. In the outside world, if you do that, you're going to get much further than the person who says, hey, hey, that's wrong. <laughs> oh, you messed up. All that does is drive people away. Hmm. It does. So what can we leave our, our people with uh, today as some parting words? I have a, a, a quote that I want to share as well. What do you think? Go for it. Go for that quote. Okay. I have a, a Sir Ken Robinson quote, and I think that he pretty much uh, puts things in perspective. Uh, Ken Robinson says, now the problem with standardized tests is that it's based on the mistake that we can simply scale up the education of children like you would scale up making carburetors. And we can't because human beings are very different from motor cars. And they have feelings about what they do and motivations in doing it or not. We're not machines. We're people. We're not data. We're people. The data can be used to drive instruction, but it should not be used to evaluate instruction. It's one of many tools. And if a teacher needs data only to drive instruction, that teacher is limited and is also limiting the opportunities to the students, we need to open up our eyes and ears to all the data that's around us. The data that's tested, the data that's observed, the data that's spoken, the data that's interacted. 
It's all data in one method, one manner or another. And if we don't feel that, then we really don't feel the art of teaching. We feel the act of teaching. It's only one letter difference, the R and the C. But I'd much rather be an artist than someone who is acting a part. Right on. That's spot on, brother. And I, I could tell you, uh, you know, as my, what I want to leave people with is just re re remember this. Uh, happy people outperform unhappy people. And how do we get to that happy place? It's not just a moment. It's a movement. And everybody, everybody out there has had stress in their lives and unhappiness. But what I like to do is hit the floor in the morning with love and gratitude, not only for what I have, but what I'm about to have. And I found that that has made all the difference in the world for me. Now, how about if your students do that? Name the five things that make them happy and go spend time doing that and encourage them to do that and it, it, encourage that that heart work that we've been talking about during this episode. So, uh, wow, I appreciate you. Peace and love. Always win. Same with you, Frank, and same to everybody. Thank you so much for sitting in with us today. We are a new podcast. We have issues, and we'll be discussing issues down the road on a variety of, of topics and concerns that we as educators have, not just in the classroom, but in our community at large, because that is our classroom. Our classroom is the community at large, and you all our community as well. So on behalf of my partner, Frank, I'm Joe Pizzo. For Dr. Frank Rudneski, thank you for visiting with us today. It's always a pleasure.